Kia ora, welcome to Parliament TV. The following story comes from the TVNZ Digital Production Library. This assignment programme focusing on the issues around global warming was broadcast in April 2000. Good evening. Imagine a world so hot that the polar ice caps are melting, a world where coastal cities are inundated, where tropical atolls are erased from the map by rising seas. It's a doomsday scenario that many scientists say is happening right now. To save the world, they say, requires concerted global action to reduce carbon emissions. Our government agrees and is now determined to lead the way into a cleaner future. But others are less certain. Tonight, reporter Jackie Ma investigates the environmental story of the millennium. Is this it? At home and abroad, the weather gone mad. Is this the global climate meltdown the doomsayers have been promising? The result of global warming, the consequence of humanity pouring fossil fuels into the atmosphere. The consequences of global warming are second only to the consequences of all-out nuclear war. Or are we panicking for no good scientific reason? In case you missed it, there have been floods and droughts going on since biblical days, and they'll continue to go on in the future. There is no proof or solid evidence that global warming is taking place. But Earth's average temperature has increased by nearly one degree in the last century. Doesn't sound much, but just a three degree change caused the last ice age. And scientists predict Earth could warm up by that over the next hundred years. Accelerating global temperatures, they say, will touch off potentially massive disruptions in weather patterns. More rapid climate change than anything Earth's experienced in the last 10,000 years. Like a river in full flood, nigh impossible to slow, let alone stop, or turn back. We live from a scientific point of view at a very exciting moment, but from the point of view of human beings, from the point of view of society, from the point of view of ecosystems, it is in fact a dangerous moment. And an expensive one. If we are to survive the predicted crisis, it will cost us big time. And that's every New Zealander. But talk to scientific skeptics, and that's money wasted on a global warming gravy train no one's prepared to derail. They say there's little, if any, danger. But real or exaggerated, the government's already committing taxpayers' money to this. Tonight, we examine the debate and the cost of global warming. This is arguably the greatest environmental crisis Earth has ever faced. Scientists and politicians will gather in The Hague this year to try and hammer out a global defence plan against global warming. They agree Earth is heating up. They are increasingly sure civilization is to blame. The warming that's projected if we do nothing over the century is in some sense unimaginable. But what the politicians hope to do is equally unimaginable. You are asking, at some point, every country in the world to become involved in reducing its reliance on the, the, the lifeblood of transportation and industrial production. Uh, it's a huge ask. It would be beaut if New Zealanders understood this issue, understood its impact on their lives and said, 
as a will, we want to turn around and do something about that. New Zealand's gunning to be one of the first developed countries to sign up to the Kyoto Protocol. That's an international promise to cut greenhouse gas emissions back to 1990 levels by 2012. We're already emitting 20% more than that. The Commissioner for the Environment doubts we'll make either the target or the deadline. I don't think we are going to get there, um, and that's not being defeatist, it's actually being realistic in the sense that uh, because there are many changes in behaviour that have to take place, behaviour, not beliefs, behaviour, uh, by citizens in all walks of life, uh, that's a slow process. We're actually determined that we're going to meet those uh, targets. We're a, we are in a really rude position in that our emissions have kept on increasing since 1990, rather than coming down, and we must, must turn that round. We'd like to see it this year. We've got quite a reputation for New Zealand to overcome. It did get the Fossil of the Year award last year from the non-governmental groups for being so slow on these issues. We want to change that reputation. Remember, the Green Party is breathing down Labour's neck. They hold the balance of power, and the Greens have much more radical plans. We want to go a lot further than this government does in addressing climate change, or at least we want to go faster. For example, we believe that in addition to a broad framework for energy efficiency and the development of renewables, we also need some financial incentives to people to reduce their use of fossil fuels. We have long advocated a low level carbon charge so that the polluters actually pay for their pollution. The government is not receptive at the moment to suggestions of tax changes, but we will keep pushing them on that. But it's not that easy for New Zealand. Although per capita we're one of the least energy efficient nations in the OECD, we don't have a lot of dirty industry to clean up. We don't have scores of coal-fired power stations to shut down. But we can start investing more in renewable energies. We can use less fossil fuel. In fact, that process has already begun. The new energy efficiency bill introduced by the Green Party aims to tighten standards for household appliances, buildings and eventually motor cars. The only fair way to deal with climate change is to say every citizen of the world has a right to an equal share of the atmosphere, an equal share to the capacity to absorb carbon, if you like. New Zealanders are using at least double their share internationally and eight times their share as far as methane emissions are concerned. Uh, we simply have to get back to a more equitable situation among nations. Not surprisingly, one person who agrees it's not just the big boys who have to clean up their act is the chair of one of the greenhouse lobby groups, Comelco's environmental manager. When you look at the statistics, you see that methane is a major contributor, your driver is a major contributor, small and medium-sized manufacturers are major contributors. So our belief is that in order for New Zealand to meet this target, cost effectively, it's got to be a community-wide approach. There's only so far that you can grind those big energy users down in terms of efficiencies. So then, in fact, the gains have got to be made by going right through all the smaller businesses and right down to households, even though households or residential use of energy is only about 13% of the total energy use in New Zealand. So there's, n there's no one big thing. There is a whole lot of small things that have to be done. But at what cost? So far, our government has published no detailed sums. The evidence seems to suggest that it is a massive um, dislocation of economies that would be called for if there was going to be a really tangible impact. Now, I think it would be irresponsible of the government to commit New Zealand to anything of this nature, which is so significant, without giving the community an opportunity to debate what the cost is and whether it's willing to accept it. But why bother? Why should a small country like New Zealand lose millions to satisfy the Kyoto Protocol, which all agree will do no more than slow global warming by 0.1 of a degree? I don't know why you want to do it. I mean, you're not going to affect the climate. The United States is not willing to go along. We're small, we can get people together, we can actually do things domestically and show the rest of the world it is possible. We don't have the facts straight yet, and there is no need, in my view, to worry this much. I don't think we need draconian economic policies. 
Now, if you think you do and you want to do them, that is your entitlement as a citizen or a politician or what have you. But don't say that the scientists have given you an equivocal reason for believing that because that is not the case. But mainstream scientists tell us if the world carries on business as usual, greenhouse gas emissions will triple by the end of this century, accelerating global warming and climate change even further. I'm sorry, folks, but at what point do you start saying, we better get worried about this? The Kyoto Protocol, with all countries as signatories, is a bit like a last will and testament, a parent's attempt to make sure their children will be all right. Only what the United Nations is attempting is a will on a planetary scale. It may not, in the end, be necessary, but it may also be too late. Well, this is the trouble. Nobody knows the precise consequences. Uh, all we know is that we're taking a risk. We're also knowing that we're taking a risk not on a five or ten year time frame, but on a 50 or 100 year time frame. And I suppose that's why I say this is the most ambitious treaty ever attempted. You're asking one generation of people to make a very, very significant precautionary step on the basis of avoiding harm a century or more from now. To delay till you've actually got the proof is going to delay um, to the point where you're actually going over the waterfall and it'll be too late by then. After the break, the scientists tell us why we should be taking greenhouse action. The rising tide of concern for global warming and the massive climate damage it may bring reached New Zealand shores earlier this year in the shape of 120 climate scientists from all over the globe. Here at Auckland's Waipuna Lodge, the world's best in climate science have crammed themselves into the boardrooms, offices, even the dining room to thrash out the latest in global warming science. If you dropped a bomb on this place, you'd lose more than half the world's top expertise in climatology. They belong to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a United Nations group set up just over a decade ago to review and assess the science of climate change, to provide best estimates for the policymakers. Is it possible that West Africa could have a 5 to 8 degree change? In 1995, they concluded that man has had a discernible influence on climate change. That was controversial to environmentalists for not sticking their necks out far enough, to oil producing countries and business for going too far. They're working on the third report due out early next year. Is the science in this latest draft report going to be stronger and more certain than in the last? In some very important aspects, the science is going to be stronger than ever. There is now overwhelming evidence that Earth's climate has changed. We live in a much different world climate-wise than people lived in 100 years ago. Earth is warmer. It's warmer at the surface. It's warmer aloft. The glaciers are shrinking almost worldwide. Arctic ice is shrinking. Snow cover is diminishing. We live in a world which is just not the same, and it's going to change even more in the future. To understand how global warming affects Earth's weather, we must first understand how the climate system works. The whole climate system, what it's trying to do is make the temperature the same everywhere. So the, the, the winds and the ocean currents will just go forever, pushing that heat away from the tropics towards the poles. And that, that's, that's the, the one line <laughs> story of the climate. It's that constant friction, the constant circulation of ocean currents and air interacting that makes the weather. Earth's endless, seemingly chaotic attempt to equalise temperature across the globe. It's a cycle that can display huge natural variations over one day, massive variations over the millennia. The ice ages, the tropical age of the dinosaurs and our own more temperate era are all ultimately due to one thing a warming or cooling of Earth's average surface temperature. If the Earth gets warmer, just a degree or two, then we notice a change in the climate. What happens with, with global warming is a lot of the, the heat goes into evaporating moisture. Uh, the planet sweats. If, if you get heated up, you sweat, and it's the evaporation of the moisture from the surface of your skin that keeps you cool. 
Well, the planet does the same thing, but the moisture gets into the atmosphere. There's evidence that the amount of moisture in the atmosphere is increasing, and that moisture then gets into weather systems, and it rains harder when it does rain as a consequence. And that's likely to be the thing that's going to affect people around the world much more than a relatively small change in temperature. So a warmer, wetter world, warming up due to the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases act a bit like the roof of a glass house. They let the sun's energy in, but when that energy tries to radiate back out into space, they trap some of it. That causes the atmosphere to heat up. Now that's a natural process. Without it, the Earth's surface would freeze. But industry and agriculture have added significant amounts of greenhouse gases. CO2 levels in the atmosphere are now the highest in 10,000 years. And it's mankind's increasing contribution to the greenhouse effect that scientists claim is turning up the temperature. If nothing's done and civilization keeps pouring waste gases into the air, scientists predict global average temperature will double and double again this century. A warmer Earth makes warmer oceans, and because water expands when it's heated, rising sea levels. The sea is predicted to rise half a metre by the end of the century. And as the Pacific is learning, it won't stop there. Even if we were to stabilise gas emissions right now, sea levels would go on rising for centuries, until the oceans had warmed all the way down to the bottom. In addition, I might add that there's a big wild card with regard to sea level rise, and that's the potential behaviour of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Uh, collapse of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, that is its total disintegration, would add uh, four to six metres to sea level rise, which would be absolutely catastrophic for what we now know as coastal civilization. Global warming could ironically plunge us back into an ice age. More rain and melting ice, adding fresh water into the oceans, will upset that ocean circulation system that drives climate. Some say if the warm Gulf Stream changed direction, even 100 kilometres or so, Europe could be plunged into a new ice age within 70 years. But what's more likely from global warming is wilder, wetter weather for some, drier for others. Just how is not clear, but scientists suspect the extra heat going into the ocean has tipped the balance towards the more severe El Nino floods and droughts the world suffered in the last 20 years. If carbon dioxide were to quadruple, which could happen if we just did nothing uh, during the 21st century, the global average warming could reach something like six or seven degrees Celsius. That would make Earth nearly as warm as it was when dinosaurs were running around. And the changes that would occur in terms of storminess, ocean circulation, the stability of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, <clears throat> the uh, viability of agriculture, the, the, uh, the viability of coastal civilization in the face of a, a tremendous sea level rise, um, all of that makes it a world that any sensible person would try to stay away from. There is a, an element, if you like, that tends to simplify, tends in my view to exaggerate slightly, and tends, most importantly, to scare people. And if this then results in governments passing policies that have dire economic consequences, I feel duty bound as a scientist to explain to the public that there's more to it than meets the eye. Seconded by Dr. Robert Balling from Arizona State University. In New Zealand, a guest of the Business Roundtable. If you think we're all done with the science, that's crazy. Um, the scientific uh, body right now has more work to do than ever. And another climate change scientist, Professor Richard Lindzen from MIT, agrees there's overreaction. So you have this small amount of warming, whether you want to worry about it or not, it has more to do with your psychology than anything else. Far from facing the largest atmospheric emergency of all time, these scientists say global warming could turn out to be a fizzer. That's if the planet is warming at all. Addressing United Nations climate scientists in Auckland to discuss global warming, Environment Minister Marion Hobbs flew the greeny flag. We will be keeping a close eye on the progress of international discussions this year with a view to making good this government's commitment to ratify the Kyoto Protocol as soon as that is appropriate. That drew a hostile response from one American scientist here. She wanted to get something that would give her the get-go to be more vigorous on it. And you know, that's coming up every place. Government officials are just eager. <laughs> 
And do you think they're wasting their time? Uh, no, I think they're exerting illegitimate pressure. Explain that. Well, when a government official tells somebody who depends on the government for their support what answer they're supposed to get, that's not a good sign. And you're saying our minister did that? I think she did that. In what way? Explain By saying you. that she hoped that we would now come up with a definite proof that it exists. Professor Lindzen doesn't believe the greenhouse effect is all it's been made out to be. Nor does Auckland climatologist Krista Freitas. The problem with global warming science is that the climate is a very complex uh, system, very complex, and uh, we don't understand it. So what we do is we, we generate theory. Theory is conjecture, speculation. So we, we generate this theory and then set about proving it. So until we've proved our theory, until, or at least until we can have give credence to our theory, it's no sense believing it or certainly not passing economic policy and, and getting all uptight or, or telling, teaching it to school kids as if it is true. After the break, the scientific showdown. The nub of the global warming sceptic argument is up here in the clouds. The key to sceptics' claims that science has greatly exaggerated the dangers of greenhouse warming. Up until recently, sceptics doubted there was any real warming at all, blaming hot cities for skewing temperature readings. Most readings are taken in and around cities like here in Wellington, where average temperatures can be boosted by urbanisation. Scientists now take account of that, but the sceptics have moved the debate higher into the troposphere. They point to the skies to challenge whether that's happening at all. Now there's no argument Earth has warmed up by about half a degree over the last century. But that warm-up only shows up on the Earth's surface. Satellites have been measuring temperatures in the upper atmosphere, the troposphere, for about the last 20 years. And they show little if any temperature rise. So here we have an, an a record that's of highly good, highly uh, high quality, and very credible, and, and covers the whole world. Not a, not based on a thermometer in the middle of Tokyo or a, a thermometer at, at Auckland International Airport. And that data shows no warming globally. Very simply, if there is a man-made greenhouse effect, the troposphere should be warming up, not just the Earth's surface. That it isn't, sceptics claim, negates the greenhouse warming theory. You know, if the public understood that, for instance, they would then understand why when one says the atmosphere isn't warming but the surface is, one is pretty much precluded greenhouse warming being the reason for the surface warming. The response from mainstream scientists, so what? They say the satellite readings in no way invalidate the conclusion that surface temperature has been rising like us putting uh, another blanket on our bed at night. In bed, we warm up, but if you were above the bed, that cools down. Much of the warming this century took place before 1940, before civilization really started pumping CO2 into the air. Even now, man-made waste gases make up just 2% of total global greenhouse emissions which themselves make up less than 1% of the atmosphere. Skeptics say the warming could be no more than natural climate variability, just weather. Now, global climate isn't steady. You, get, you, know, you have heat waves and, 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 um, and cold snaps, and you have droughts and floods. Climate has always been like that, and it would never change. To, to, to put it down to global warming is silly when there's no evidence. Well, we're certain that we've seen uh, a warming over the last 100, 130 years of, of just over half a degree. We're certain that there have been increases in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and those are equivalent to about a 50% or more increase in CO2 since the pre-industrial time. And we're certain that uh, that rise is due to human activity. It's too big to be explained by just natural fluctuations of the atmosphere and ocean. Look at this graph. Watch how carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere have climbed since pre-industrial times. Now look how scientists predict they'll increase this century if we do nothing. Less if we start using more renewable energies like solar heating and wind power. But most significantly, look what happens if we heavily reduce our fossil fuel emissions. 
because CO2 stays in the atmosphere, concentrations will still be considerably higher. But sceptics believe we can't trust the predictions. Nor, they say, is it safe to rely on predictions it'll get even warmer. That, the sceptics say, is based on forecasting science that's off beam. Climatologists at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in Wellington, betting in their new multi-million dollar supercomputer, might disagree. This is cutting-edge computer technology used to make up the climate models that forecast a globally warmed future. The globe is divided up into a grid, each point of that grid a few hundred kilometres apart. Measurements of air and sea temperature, rainfall, ocean currents, wind directions and pressure are taken or calculated for each grid point, then fed into the computer. We actually use these expressions, these mathematical equations, to take the climate now and predict it for only 20 minutes into the future. And once you've done it a few million times, you might have predicted a century into the future. But that future picture, sceptics claim, is flawed because too little is taken into account. Climate is affected by many things apart from greenhouse gases, among them volcanic activity, water vapour and particularly clouds. And clouds are a source of concern for the sceptics. So if the clouds are poorly represented, we don't get the rain right. If we don't get the rain right, we don't get the surface energy balance right, because we don't get surface hydrology right. And you would start to see a lot of uncertainties that cascade through the system associated with not getting clouds quite right. Richard Lindzen goes further. He claims if climate models represented clouds correctly, that is, as cooling factors, reflecting the sun's energy back into space, mainstream global warming forecasts would be radically different. As far as we can tell, clouds behave in a manner to prevent warming. You know, we might be wrong, or it might run into flack even if it's right, uh, but if it is right, it, it says that uh, the models have been mis misrepresenting this. And you say it's huge. You say that impact of that alone... Yeah, oh will... yeah, would cancel all the positive feedbacks. It would change a model that is saying you'll get four degrees warming for a doubling of CO2. It would change that to about 0.5. So, sceptics believe ignorance about the most important greenhouse factors is skewing the models. They're talking about water vapour in the atmosphere, the Earth's sweat in clouds. Water vapour is the most important greenhouse gas. As temperatures rise, more water is evaporated. More water vapour in the atmosphere traps more heat and leads to a rise in temperature. So water vapour acts to warm the atmosphere even further. In scientific jargon, water vapour is a positive feedback on global warming. The water vapour feedback is, is, is fairly robust. Uh, one would have to really um, have a very dramatically different way in the atmosphere work to, to make that negative. But Professor Richard Lindzen believes water vapour can cool too. That is, in the jargon, have a negative feedback on global warming. And that's not taken into account enough. If it was, he says, global warming models would predict just half the degrees warming if CO2 concentrations doubled. This is huge. In other words, it's, it, it sounds like you're nitpicking, but without this, the models would give a half degree. Lindzen's theory would derail the official estimated increase in world temperature of between one and four degrees by the end of this century. Now, to do that would require an enormous negative uh, water vapour feedback, and particularly, as I think even Lindzen would agree, that's probably confined to the tropics, which is half the globe. So if the water vapour feedback is really that strong and negative, we should have no trouble finding it, but we can't find it. Clouds are closely related to water vapour. The more water vapour in the atmosphere, the cloudier it is, and it has been cloudier in the last hundred years. We don't yet fully understand how clouds work for or against global warming. The scientists concede that. But we do know that high altitude clouds tend to trap the heat, increase temperatures. Lower altitude clouds reflect heat back out into space. The mainstream view is they tend to cancel each other out. Uh, there have been all sorts of tests comparing observed clouds with model clouds. The models do very badly. The things that he is concerned about are, are certainly legitimate, but 
the models incorporate most of what he is talking about. They have the distribution of water vapor simulated very realistically with the mean annual cycle and with changes in El Nino. And there is no reason at the moment to disbelieve the projections of the models in the future and the climate change that goes along with that. In other words, the climate models are good enough and they are predicting a warmer, wetter world. More intense rainstorms, but harsher droughts in drought-prone regions. While mainstream scientists stop short of predicting more storms due to global warming, privately, some say a warmer world will probably be a wilder one. So what's in the wind, according to the skeptics? A slight increase in temperature, no more. Not enough to see sea levels rise much. Certainly not enough to melt the polar ice caps. A warming that will moderate nighttime and winter temperatures more than it raises daytime and summer temperatures, and mostly in the polar regions, less at the equator. Well, I mean, so what if the coldest air masses of the world are warming up? Who's bothered by that? I'm not. I don't know any organism that really cares that you've gone from minus 30 to minus 28. There doesn't seem to be an impending disaster. Nothing suggests that there is. You know, the globe isn't, there's not runaway warning. The, the frequency of hurricanes are not occurring. The, the sea rise that we observe has been occurring for the last 300 years. Why blame it on, on something that may not, in fact, be connected at all? But there is no denying carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing nearly half again as high as in pre-industrial days, the highest in the last 10,000 years. But no cause for panic, the skeptics say we should welcome it. It encourages growth, it increases water resistance, you know, drought resistance of plants. It does all sorts of nice things. You know, if you have a hothouse and you're growing flowers, you pump CO2 in. The last time mankind experienced similarly warm temperatures was at the turn of the last millennium. Skeptics say that's more like our future. It could very well be argued that the impacts of global warming are mainly beneficial. Now, I'm not advocating that we should then increase greenhouse gas emissions to improve the climate, because that would be absurd. But you cannot say that all that we're doing is going to lead to, to disaster. These plants outside are screaming out loud, more CO2, more CO2. And they evolved in a world of much higher CO2. They want to go back to that world of higher CO2. It may be a wonderful thing for the planet. While some species in some places will undoubtedly have enhanced growth due to carbon dioxide, many species and many ecosystems will suffer. And in many cases, entire ecosystems, like forests in some areas, will simply disappear. It may not even be an argument on how much CO2 is too much, but whether we can withstand the pace of the climate change greenhouse warming will bring. The issue is not how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere. It's really the rate of change. We've had big changes in the past, and you know the Earth has gone through major ice ages and glacial periods and interglacial periods, and, but it, has, it occurs over millions of years. And here, what we're doing in the next century is changing the climate at a rate which is unprecedented on that time scale. And that means that the adjustments have to occur very rapidly. There's little doubt greenhouse action will hurt in the pocket, and that's just at Kyoto Protocol levels. Our CO2 emissions as at 1990. But at that level, CO2 would keep growing in the atmosphere. Global warming would continue. To stabilize global warming would take a 60 to 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions worldwide. You would need to massively reduce the global emission of carbon dioxide to the point where it's inconceivable. I mean, you're putting people back on horses. In terms of global change, I think we're developing a kind of philosophy, which is weird, that the Earth is in a very delicate balance and but for our tender ministrations would tip over. It's lasted four billion years. You know, it's seen a lot worse than we've done. The Earth will go on. The question is whether we'll go on with it. When we come back, will the United States, the biggest polluter of them all, support Kyoto? And if it doesn't, where does that leave New Zealand? There's no global warming debate in the South Pacific. Climate change here is all too real. 
If sea levels rise as predicted, the low-lying atoll of Tuvalu faces annihilation. Like many in the Pacific, they are looking to New Zealand for help. People fear that the country will submerge in five or ten years' time. So they look upon New Zealand as the, the only place they can come to to set, set, to set up their residences here. According to one estimate, rising sea levels combined with the more intense floods and droughts predicted with climate change could lead to more than 150 million environmental refugees by mid-century. Many in the Pacific could be knocking on our door. One reason why New Zealand is gunning to be among the first developed countries to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. That's the international commitment to cut back carbon dioxide emissions. We're a Pacific country, and our neighbours, from which many of our people, New Zealand citizens, come, their lives, their islands are in danger. We have a responsibility to be an international voice. That earns a guarded nod from environmentalists. Greenpeace's Sue Connor. We're pleased that they've come out and made a stance. However, we've heard stances before, we've heard, we've heard promises before. We want to see when it's going to happen. We want to hear that there's a timetable. I mean, we have seen 10 years of failure, a decade of failure under the last government. We don't want to see that again. Former Environment Minister Simon Upton took some of the flack for being slow to act. Even though he supports the Kyoto Treaty, he sees difficulties. Well, as, as environmental agreements go, it is by far the most ambitious treaty that has ever been attempted. Uh, and I don't think that the public and many governments actually realise quite how ambitious it is. So New Zealand conforms to Kyoto. But the global warming sceptics look at the Kyoto Protocols and ask, why is New Zealand bothering? If you're serious about stabilizing the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this requires an enormous reduction of emission around the world, an enormous uh, reduction that's inconceivable. You can't cater for a policy or impact um, in fact, when, when your science is, is 40. But most countries have already agreed precautionary action is needed. Better safe than sorry. I think there is a good precautionary case for taking action. Now that action, as uh, envisaged by Kyoto, is relatively modest. Uh, but at least if we've taken action, we've developed the systems, we understand how we'd go about making further reductions, we're on the road. But if New Zealand does ratify, what does that add up to? We're, after all, just a blip on the world's carbon dioxide emissions graph. Don't deceive yourself believing that there's a whole lot New Zealand's going to do straight up that will ever reduce CO2 emission globally or at all affect global climate. Strong stuff, but then Dr. Balling is a self-confessed advocate for United States coal companies. He's in New Zealand at the invitation of the Business Roundtable. Greenpeace's Kirsty Hamilton says scientists like Dr. Balling are in the business of confusing the global warming debate. Well, those scientists have been used deliberately and systematically by the fossil fuel industry, by oil interests and coal interests to undermine climate science. We know that the American Petroleum Institute, which still contains Shell and BP, as well as Exxon and others, have been trying to undermine any form of implementation in the United States of action to cut greenhouse gases. And we've just seen what kind of, um, what kind of activity that the New Zealand Business Roundtable have done in choosing to still bring out climate skeptics to confuse the debate in New Zealand. They came to me and said, would you go out and appear at different functions for me. So I guess you're right. I would become something of a PR man for the boys, but the fact is they don't tell me what to say. I'm still out there representing the science as I see it. Dr. Balling claims it's the mainstream scientists who are compromised by a global warming gravy train. It's big business today. I mean, let's face it, the scientists have made out like bandits on this whole thing. As more individuals talk about global warming, governments get more involved, more government groups spend more money on global warming, more people are suddenly hooked into the global warming crusade. And on top of that, you've got delegations from all over the world going to one meeting after another talking about global warming. 
I can't tell you how many friends I have that went to graduate school with me, and they're involved in different government groups to stabilize climate or whatever. It's big business today. But Kiwi scientist Kevin Trenberth, now living in the United States, claims few scientists are directly funded for greenhouse warming research. It's just that many research projects now lead to global warming. Most of the scientists here, they're, they're, most of their research is not actually funded under anything to do with global warming. My own research is actually more related to things uh, dealing with El Nino and variations from year to year and, and natural variations. But one of the things I come across is these changes that are going on. Why have all of these, the biggest El Ninos on record just occurred recently? And so I run headlong into the problem of climate change. Trenberth claims that in some United States government circles, climate change is almost a dirty word. The Congress is under Republican control and holds the purse strings and funding for global warming research has been uh, very poorly supported in the last eight years. And so if you want to get funding for doing your research, you're better off not saying you're doing, doing global warming. Even Bob Balling agrees that global warming and the Kyoto Protocol are not high on the U.S. Senate's agenda. In fact, I had a senator tell me that uh, his biggest problem would be controlling the laughter in a Senate chamber as the Kyoto Protocol is presented to the Senate. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Americans are not on board. I think New Zealand governments are going to have to make a very strong case to the community that uh, a country which is only at a middle income level and with lots of problems of, uh, of hardship uh, should actually impose such costs on it for what appear at this stage to be pretty neb nebulous gains. We've got to plant our flag and say, we're leading the way, but I desperately need to take the people of New Zealand with me. If I can draw an analogy, remember how nuclear disarmament grabbed New Zealand communities? You know, you turned up in, uh, in, in Wellington and you come through the airport and it says, this is a nuclear-free city. And that happened, it was replicated right throughout New Zealand. It's important for us to stake a flag and say, we will ratify this protocol but we must do that knowing that we're already starting to improve our own behaviour inside New Zealand. The Environment Minister's advisers have a less idealistic view. We've got to convince larger countries to take the issue seriously, to think about taking, taking deeper reductions in the future. And to do that, we will have no credibility to go out and and preach that message if we're not seen to be taking proper action at home. We're not doing our bit. But doing our bit depends on the Kyoto Protocol coming into force, which is by no means certain. Now it's crunch time. Dutch climate negotiator Ivo de Boer will host the next meeting of Kyoto Protocol countries. We've reached a point, or will reach a point at the end of this year, where either we get something um, on paper and signed up um, that people are willing to implement, or I'm very much afraid that a lot of political momentum will just slip away from us. While New Zealand in the past has been active in these negotiations, it's been perhaps within a more conservative group of countries, and now it's very clearly moving to a, a greener, um, more progressive part of the, uh, of the debate. In the past, clean green New Zealand blew its image, with a conservative stand on reductions in greenhouse gases, outraging environmentalists like Canadian David Suzuki. At Kyoto, the, the behavior of your country and mine was absolutely reprehensible. People uh, mockingly referred to the juice cans country, countries, Japan, the United States, Canada, New Zealand and Australia, the juice cans country, countries who were opposing as a group any imposition of serious greenhouse gas emission uh, standards. And because of the juice cans countries, the uh, Kyoto conference uh, decided on a far less rigorous um, target. New Zealand certainly has the prospect of being very green on climate change, but unfortunately it sided with some of the climate baddie countries like the United States who have sought to undermine global action on climate change. Now New Zealand appears to have seen the greenhouse light, but Ivo de Boer believes the United States, the biggest greenhouse gas emitter of them all, may get left behind. I think on climate change there's this momentum building that um, we have to move on this topic, whether the Americans go along or not. At this stage the Americans aren't moving, not even if they get a new president sympathetic to the Kyoto Protocol. US Senator Chuck Hagel. Even if Al Gore would become president, uh, this treaty has absolutely no chance, no possibility 
uh, of being ratified. It takes 67 s senators, 67 votes out of 100 for the United States Senate to ratify a treaty. Uh, it, it, has, it has no uh, chance of, of being ratified in the, in the foreseeable future. The United States Senate's refusing to play ball until developing countries like China and India sign up to the Kyoto Protocol. But they are reluctant to miss out on the years of economic growth the developed world has already enjoyed. In 10 years, developing countries are tipped to overtake the developed world in greenhouse gas emissions. When the biggest man-made greenhouse emitters are on the outside of the treaty and not bound to anything, how are you going to reduce it? You can't. It's impossible. So it's nonsensical. The whole thing is folly. One of the surprising possibilities that arose in Jackie's report was the prospect of a new ice age. It's interesting to recall that the last one was less than 20,000 years ago. Most experts believe that it probably lasted for about 100,000 years. At its height, so much water was turned into ice that ocean levels dropped at least 90 metres. That assignment program was broadcast on the 20th of April 2000. The next story is from the Koha series. It was broadcast in March 1985 and looks at the state of Māori radio. For rights reasons, some elements of this program have been removed. Tātou te hungora, ti he mauri ora. Whiki mai, kake mai, wakarongo ki te tangi a te hui a hui. Hui mai tātou, whiti whiti kore ro piua ki te awe. Hei mata ki taki, hei wakarongo ronga, mā te tini me te mano e. Too, for a and this one is hot off the telex. So in a moment, I'll have the Herald, it's hot off the, the paper boy. So this is Auckland 1ZB at a gorgeous morning. Let's check with uh, Owen Rouse of the Ministry of Transport, see how things look from their point of view. Good morning, Owen. Yes, good morning, Mayor. On the Harbour Bridge, we have five lanes south and uh, three north. Elio Iglesias and Willie Nelson on Radio Eye as we check traffic with Bill Mudgeway. Michael, thank you. And if you're going up the Western Motorway, when you get to the top and turn right to Hobsonville, watch for a big hole in the road. So that's it, going into the city, the eye in the sky, Radio Eye. Thank you, Bill. Time is Waggy exactly in the morning. Well, Liz Malloy, a meta bag just went off with $150 in trivial pursuit. Your chance for more money, huh? Music one, Amidst the music and hype of mainstream radio, we hear a lone voice in the Reo Tuturu of New Zealand. Kia ora, I'm the Peter Curtis. Here is the Māori news. E whaia ke nei ata tau pito pito kore ro mo te nei ata. Kei te manawa pāra wātou te tumua ki o manawa... Māori language has only over recent years become a regular sound on the airwaves. Polynesian Heritage Trust Mo te whakatinana i te pikiti o te Polynesia i Waenganui a tātou i te iwi Māori me ngā iwi o ngā mautere. Ahakoa kei te āwhinei i te taha mo te hāpai... Te reo Aotearoa, the country's only Polynesian broadcasting unit, was established in 1978 as part of Radio New Zealand. The unit, which is based in South Auckland, serves the largest Polynesian population in the world. It's headed by a man who feels that the media, especially radio and television, should be the right arm of the educational process when people are striving for social change. Hare Williams of the Taitanga Mahaki, Rungo Fakata and Tuhoe came to work in radio as an extension to his background as an artist, teacher and university lecturer. He sees Māori radio as a considerable personal commitment. Kia ora, Radio New Zealand. Although the station covers a wide range of Polynesian cultures, a strong Māori influence is evident. 
That influence comes from a clear idea Hardy has about the place of Māori radio in New Zealand today. Well, some recognition of the uh, sharing of the equity in terms of um, broadcasting, the resources of broadcasting with Māori people. A recognition, I think, of the place of Māori people as tangata whenua, as people, the indigenous people of the land, with their language, with their, with their value system. And I think to make Māori people themselves feel that they have a legitimate place within the mainstream of the New Zealand economy and through broadcasting, through the media, and those things that are reflected by the most powerful medium of all, television, of course, and radio, that they feel that they have a place in the rationale of things. I think, in broad terms, the rationale of broadcasting is such that it is, in terms of uh, people, their culture, it still, I think, maintains cultural and linguistic imperialism. And so I think what I hoped to achieve was a greater deal of equity in terms of broadcasting for, for our people, but also in terms of being able to articulate and reflect the deeper sensitivities of their things, uh, their, their aspirations and also their achievements, their concerns, and not to be seen as a violent subculture of New Zealand society. Although the audience in this corner of Polynesia is considerable, on-air time is limited and staff numbers small. Nine staff members daily produce news, magazine and current affairs programmes in many Polynesian tongues. For the Māori, programmes in the language are heard only for one hour and 15 minutes a week. Te Reo Aotearoa has become more than just a radio station. It provides the iwi Māori with one of the most important collections of recordings of our tūpuna. Guardian of these taonga is Hinare Te Ua. In this room here, you see many, many hundreds and hundreds of tapes which have been recorded over a period of 30 or 40 years. A lot of these tapes now contain voices of many, many of our kaumātua who are no longer with us. Many, many of our waiata, of our ori ori, our pātere and so on, which many, many of our Māori people no longer can sing, but they're here. Now, part of our function is to remain faithful caretakers of this material so that when my turn here to do on is over, I can safely say, well, look, let's hand this over to you. You look after it all. The material within the four walls of the archive room is irreplaceable and no monetary value can be put on its worth. The words and history of great people are not just memories here. They are a reality for their mokupuna. One thing I'd like to say to all New Zealanders at home. Māori broadcasting started in 1927. The following years saw a number of popular Māori broadcasters. One of these was Kingi Tahiwi, heard here just prior to being reported missing in action during World War II. We over here are always proud to be recognised and acknowledged as New Zealanders because of the untiring example you're setting in the Pacific. That is why we're also anxious to get this business over and set sail for our tower. Good luck to you all. Eko, ehine, mahoma ikona. Tihe Māori ora. Tēnā koutou ngā mōrehu o ia kāinga, o ia kāinga, o tō tātou takiwa... World War II also saw the introduction of the Māori language on radio. This was done so that the Māori could understand what was happening at the front. For the Māoris here present, this is a day of sorrow and grief. But it is grief mingled with pride. In 1946, Wirumu Parker broadcast the Māori battalion's return at Wellington's Aotea Quay. Home these remnants of that famous galaxy of youth, whose blood has been freely shed on the altar shrines of democracy. They are proud of their boys, the boys who have, by their mortal deeds, extolled their fame on high. And now the tangi begins, the wailing of women. The weeping can be heard from here, led by the elderly woman. Ari Pitama was one of a few Māori broadcasters who became immensely popular personalities. Irene Grinnell of Dunedin was another. As a rhythmic time song in dances or canoe paddling, 
or other tasks in which concerted action is required. 1964 saw the establishment of the Māori program section. The same year, we heard the first Māori language advertisement. Over half a century later, and Māori radio has made few advances. Hinare Te Ua believes that Māori radio has a bigger role to play and has the potential to do more for Māori people. I think one of the primary ones is to be this, this vehicle by which our Māori people, especially those who still absolutely value the true essence of te reo Māori, the Māori language, can listen to programs which not only are spoken in their own vernacular language, but has a Māori orientation. Now, there's a tremendously big difference between, say, uh, what my European colleagues would call news, and what we would call news. On the one hand, my colleague would, say, treat the, the latest oil price hike or what's happening in, in, uh, in uh, the Philippines or something like that as, as being tremendous news. But I think from the point of view of Māori news, our listeners are far more interested in what's happening in the world of the churches, of the uh, unveilings, of the whānau, and so on. And that is the sort of news that we tend to concentrate on. So one of the main roles of Te Reo or Aotearoa is this disseminator, this great big party line, so people can tune in and, and they can find out what is happening within Te Ao Māori, within the Māori world. To survive, commercial radio stations need good audience ratings. One survivor is Auckland's Radio I. Hey, you've got to hide your love away. That's the sound of John Lennon. You're on the air with Pete Sinclair, tuned to 1332, Radio I. It's time for a celebration dedication. This one's Aiming at a wide audience, it has more than 200,000 listeners per day. Radio I's manager, Graham Edwin, supports the concept of Māori radio, but sees many problems. Māori's are a minority group in this country, and there is still a certain amount of bigotry. I think we have to face that fact, and uh, this bigotry does come out in the reaction by some non-Māori listeners, whether they be white or from another Polynesian country, for instance, who, um, uh, for their various reasons, uh, won't accept um, too much Māori programming on the mainstream commercial or the uh, non-commercial radio stations. The way to go, I do feel, is for a Māori-operated radio station to cater for those Māoris interested and for those who aren't Māoris who are interested. Maui Prime, better known as Delvanius, is a firm believer in the credibility of Māori radio and its ability to survive on its own. At present, he feels not enough is being done to push Māori culture and thinks stations aren't interested in Māori music. I know they aren't. No, there's, no, there's not a question of think. Uh, but then should they have to compete in mainstream radio? No, they don't. Uh, which, which warrants the need for a Māori broadcasting system, an alternative system. Um, ethnic minority radio in this country doesn't exist. Um, it exists, uh, say, in Wellington with a group of people called Radio Access um, who are trying very, very hard, yet they're only allowed to operate X amount of hours a day. Um, I think if the monocultural society of New Zealand were to stop thinking that we are a threat, the Māori people, um, and, 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 and really um, sort of give us what we want, but then why should, we, why, why should they give us what we want? I think us as Māoris and Pacific Islanders should go out and just say, well, let's just do it.
That Koha program was broadcast on the 17th of March, 1985. For some contemporary insights into the workings of Parliament, you can view a collection of short videos from the Spotlight on Parliament series. Just head to the New Zealand Parliament website at www.parliament.nz.